short time. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. We're going to continue our study in the book of Genesis. We'll look at chapter 10 and 11 tonight, but let's open up in prayer and we'll get right into the word. Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to study your word. And we pray that tonight, Lord, as we uh, move through your scriptures, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd move through our hearts, that you'd teach us, train us. Lord, give us the word, the lessons that you'd have us to know, and then give us the grace to apply the truth of your word to our life. And we'll be quick and careful to give you all the praise and the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and together we'd say, Amen. Amen. All right. Genesis chapter 10 and 11 we're going to look at. Genesis chapter 10 is an overview of the descendants of Noah and his three sons. You'll recall in our uh, past couple of weeks, we looked at the call of, of Noah, the ministry of Noah, the building of the ark of Noah, and then the flood of Noah and how all of that happened and everything going through. And chapter 10 gives us an overview of the descendants and the people groups that came from his three sons. Now, chapter 12 gives us, the first half of it, gives us really the the details of that and how they were dispersed and everything that happened. Now, the reason I say that is because in three verses of Scripture in chapter 10, we ha have this phrase that says, uh, the first one's in, in chapter 5, then in chapter 20, and then in chapter 31, we read this. It names the people, and it says, they were separated unto their lands, and everyone according to his language according to their families. Now, the reason I highlight that is because we see the language separations coming in chapter 11. And a lot of people who try to disprove the Bible and say, well, the Bible's full of contradictions, will say, see, here they were speaking in different languages in chapter 10, and here God says they only had one language in chapter 11. Well, that's where studying the Bible in its totality and its completion plays into effect. In chapter 10, we have the genealogies, and they cover things from immediately after the flood until way after the Tower of Babel, right? And so the languages started after the Tower of Babel, but would include some of the people that were listed in the genealogies of chapter 10. Isn't that simple? But see, people who really want to try to find a problem with the Word of God, they will do anything to try to get their, their point across, right? Right? And all we have to do is, as the New Testament says, rightly divide the word of God. Amen. Friends, it's incredible to me that uh, so many people are so easily fooled by a slick-tongued, serpent-inspired preacher, yeah. and they could save themselves a lot of problems if they just read the Bible. Amen. From start to finish, just read the Bible. It's so easy. Well, anyway, that's off my little hobby horse. Let's get into it, shall we? Chapter 10, verse 1 says, Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, and then he names them, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the sons that were born to them. In verses 2 through 5, he lists the sons and the descendants of Japheth. I'm not going to read all of them. I just want to um, bring your attention to verse 2 there. It says, um, the sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog. Now we know that name. Where do we know that name? Gog and Magog, they develop into the people we call the Russians today. They play a major, a major uh, part in God's plan, especially in the end times. We saw that they gave the children of Israel a hard time in the Old Testament. They're going to give the children of Israel a hard time <laughs> still in the future. Hey, speaking of the future and end time things, uh, you know there's something that's, only hap that's never happened before in the world. Our world, it's hard... It's, it, it's hard to come up with something that's never happened yet, right? But tomorrow, something's going to happen on our planet that has never happened before. Who knows what it is? Nope. We get one of those every day. A pope is going to celebrate the mass, a funeral mass, for a pope. And the whole Catholic world is, is kind of, you know, how do we do that? And, they, and what's going to happen? And all this kind of stuff. And it's very interesting because the, the Pope that passed away, he's the one who kind of retired himself for health reasons and really threw the Catholic Church in uproar because they were supposed to serve until they die. And then uh, he, was, he was pretty conservative. He was a pretty good Pope uh, other than being in a false religion. But anyway, uh, and the new Pope that's a Pope now, he's very liberal. And uh, so with the passing of this old Pope, Old Pope, the new one's 80-something, 80 86, you know. But the young Pope, uh, this is going to free him up to really push his radical liberal agenda through the rest of the Catholic Church. So it's going to be very interesting to see. 
And remember, the Pope, I believe, is going to be very influential in the, in the end time scenario to bring about globalism. Amen. Now, when we get into chapter 11 here in just a couple of minutes, we're going to see man's first attempt at, guess what? Globalism. To try to, to kick God out so man can rule. Anyway, tomorrow watch your mass. <laughs> but isn't that something? I mean, in our planet... That's something new that's never done. They might start doing it now because popes are living longer and getting you know, unhealthy and stuff. Anyway, that has nothing to do with this study. Let's keep going. Uh, the rest of those names you can read for yourself. Verses 6 through 20 are the descendants of Ham. I just want to highlight to you, let's start reading at verse 8 because this plays into effect of chapter 11. It says, Cush begot Nimrod. We're going to remember this name. He began to be be a mighty one on the earth. He starts elevating himself as a leader, having people follow him, kind of being a, a boss, so to speak, a world leader. Verse 9 says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, if we just read that as the King James has it, we kind of think, oh, God is very proud of him because he's a hunter. Well, extra biblical writings, church history, and even places in the Bible, we learn he was not a man after God's own heart. He was a very wicked man. He comes up with this first uh, attempt at globalism. In fact, uh, he was a very vile man. He starts the first world, well, not the first, that started in the garden, but this worldwide false religion that we're going to read about in just a few, few minutes here in chapter 11. And uh, history also records that he not only liked hunting game, but uh, he would hunt people. He took away the value of human life. He would hunt them for sport, kind of like we do now. You know, that's one of the, the things that Satan brought about us is taking away the, the value of humans. I mean, we, we throw them away like, like nothing. It just, they have no, no value. Friends, you're, you're valuable. And it's interesting to me that in the society that doesn't value people, doesn't value babies, don't appreciate things that God has made, people are, are hurting and it's amazing. You used to be able to tell people, smile, God loves you, and they'd smile, you know. But now they don't even believe that. The world has got them so beat down. Well, God loves you, friends. Anyway, let's keep going here. He starts to become this mighty hunter before the Lord. Before the Lord means the Lord is taking note of this guy. He's watching this guy. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. He is starting to, to get this, this reputation. But we find out. And again, the scripture will prove this out, that his reputation is, is he's separating from God. Now, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Look at this, verse 10. And the beginning of his kingdom, all this first time we hear about kingdoms after the flood. See, he starts gathering a people to himself to elevate himself to become this leader. And the beginning of his kingdom was what? Babel. Now, we're going to read about Babel here in just a few minutes. And it says all this in the land of Shinar. We're going to read about this again. So anyway, uh, verses 21 through uh, the balance of it is, is Shem's descendants. The only one I will call your attention to is if you look at verse 25. It says to Eber, um, his twin brother's Uber, he drove a chariot. Um, I just thought of that. That's not very good, right? Yeah. To Eber was born two sons. The names of one was Peleg. Now notice this. For in his days, Peleg's day, the earth was divided. Now what does that mean? Well, this is very interesting. There are some people who, again, they, don't, they won't read the Bible for what the Bible says. They say, oh, the continents changed and all this kind of stuff. That is not what it means. If you look at, at, at the chronological order... He came about when the Tower of Babel came about. What happened at the Tower of Babel? Well, we're going to see the earth divided. Not geographically, not the, not the dirt, but the people were divided. So that's kind of cool, right? Uh, and then you could read the rest of it. The next one I'll call your attention to, verse 29. Uh, it says, Ophar, Havilah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm saying these names right, but this next guy, Job, Jobab, this is believed to be the Job of the book of Job. Now, there's some mixed feelings on that, but it's just kind of interesting. I'm nothing to, you know, get crazy about, but it's kind of interesting. As you read all these things, we see that Jephthah and his families traveled north uh, 
to the north, to the west, and to the east of Europe and into Asia. They covered a lot of ground. Ham's descendants traveled and settled into the African continent, and Seth settled in the country surrounding Palestine. And we know it was Seth's descendants that, that brought about the Hebrews and the Semites and all that kind of stuff. So interesting stuff, right? I'll lead you to read the names and do all that yourself. All right, chapter 11. Here's where things are really, really interesting. This is fantastic. You guys with me? Chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. That's how the chapter starts. That's why I called your attention to the, the chapter before where it said three times everyone had their own language. Because a lot of people say, See, there's, the Bible's wrong. Just read the Bible and you'll figure it out. Now before we go any farther, I have to admit, I did not do the math on this. I took it from somebody. I use a guy by the name of Usher. And uh, he's known for putting genealogical charts together and all that stuff. He has put together, from the time of the flood to the time of the Tower of Babel, guess how long? Any guesses? The whole, the whole way. The whole way. The whole, the whole way. The whole way. <laughs> no. 100 years? Between 100 and 110 years. Now, the Tower of Babel is, is man coming against God. Only a hundred years from the flood. Mm -hmm. He also figured out that there's probably only between 1,800 and 2,000 people on the planet. We tend to think billions at the Tower of Babel, and there's not. Because it started with just the three boys, and now it's, you know, each generation it picks up numbers. But there wasn't a whole lot of people, and it's only been a hundred years since the flood. Right? But they've already forgot about God and his judgments. How, I mean, don't you think it would stick to you a little bit longer? Now look at us. Look at us Americans. Look at, look at our generation that's now running this place. They mock at World War I and World War II. I've heard elected officials and, and seminary, not seminary, university professors saying that, that America deserved 9-11. Only 200 and, not quite 250 years, we've forgotten what made this America, America. Amen. Right? That's how bad human, the human heart is. So here they are, 100 years from the flood, and they're already coming against God. That's incredible to me. Let's read it. Now, they only have the one speech, the one language. Uh, how come it says one language and one speech? Well, it goes back into the original context and all this stuff. What it is saying here is they, they spoke one language. It could be whatever language they spoke, but let's say we all speak English. That would be the language, but they had one speech. That, mean, that means they were in one accord. They had a focus, a purpose. They were all speaking the same thing. They had a goal, Right? And it says, and, they, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Who was these people went to Shinar? Well, this was Nimrod and his group, right? And they dwelled there. Now, check this out. Verse 3, and they said to one another, you know what? I apologize. I have one scripture I didn't give for them to put if you're watching at home, but I need somebody uh, who would want to... Debbie, well, 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Verse 3 says this. Then they said to one another, Come and let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone. Instead of stone, they had brick. And they had asphalt for mortar. Sounds like a good plan to build, right? Well, hang on. And they said, Come and let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. We don't need this Jehovah guy that great, great, great grandpa Noah talked about. We can get to heaven on our own. Does that sound like today's philosophy? By our own works, we can get to heaven. We're going to build this tower, tops in heaven. Let us come and make a name for ourselves. We don't need the name of Jehovah. Friends, what is the only name that can get us saved and get us into heaven? Jesus. There is no other name under heaven and earth by which you what? Must be saved. But our world is giving all kinds of names and a promise of a false salvation. I heard 
I heard I hear a lot of preachers and you 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 would know who they are they're the milk toast wimpy ones <laughs> saying there's other ways to have everything but my heart really broke this week when I saw that uh, Steve Harvey, you know who he is? <laughs> He's a great comedian. He's a Christian. This week I heard him say, oh, there's many paths to heaven. I followed Jesus. Yeah, I know it. These other preachers, it was like, oh, them heathens. But him, I was like, oh, man, dude, I watch you on Family Feud. How can you do that? You know? But there's no other name. And men from the Tower of Babel says, let us make ourselves a tower to get to heaven. Well, here's just like they tried to use fig leaves to cover their, 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 their shame and nakedness in the garden. God said, this ain't going to work. You can't do it yourself. So it says, let us make a name for ourselves. What does that mean? Again, you know, forget God. Let's do ourselves. Here's something else to think about, and I don't know if it has anything or any connection to this, but I think it's very interesting. You know, one of the signs of the end times is that people will be lovers of themselves. And boy, don't we have that happening. I mean, the selfie world is all, all this stuff. I'm going to tell you what. Okay, Clay's going to get on his little soapbox here. I, I have been very proud of myself because I've, very, I've been limiting my social media stuff, just putting on scriptures, putting on things for the church. I try a joke every now and then, and they usually flop. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I don't go scrolling through and all this stuff. But now they're highlighting these things called reels, R-E-E-L's. You guys seen this? And people are, are, this comes from this TikTok thing. I don't watch TikTok. I don't do any of this stuff like it. But people film themselves. And all it is is it, women, all they're doing is exposing themselves. They're not naked, but they're in, in underwear and bikinis and stuff like that. Or men doing dumb things, trying to jump off a building. Stuff. What are they doing? They're trying to get followers to make a name for themselves. The more followers you get, the better off you are, right? And this is what they're trying to do there. People are lovers of themselves. I, I can't take selfies. They, they, they never turned out, and then I, it dawned on me. It's, it's, it's my face. It's <laughs> I was teasing. There's pictures back there that one of the ladies took of, of where did she take that at? Anyway, there's pictures back there that someone took of the church people. There's none of me. I was like, hey, you know, but it's okay. I hate my picture taken. Anyway, let's get, that has, let's get back to this, shall we? <laughs> They're saying, let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. Who told them to scatter over the face of the earth? God did. God said, cover the planet. They said, we ain't going to do that. We're not going to do that, God. We're going to make a, a city and a name for ourselves. We're in defiance of God on this whole thing. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And if nothing else in this section is highlighted, highlight verse 6. Listen to what God says. God says, indeed, the people are one. They're in agreement. They're speaking the same thing. They have this goal to, to build the city, to build this tower, to, get, to try to get to heaven on their own. He said, and they all have one language. And if this is what they begin to do, now nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. Now they couldn't get to heaven if they tried. That's not what God's saying. Not, God's not saying if man works hard enough, he can get himself to heaven. That, that's not what he's saying. But there's a, a strong principle here and whenever couples come to me that are getting ready to get married or they're married and they're having a, a fuss I always take them to this and I always say this in your marriage what is your goal your goal should be to have heaven on earth no amens I'm gonna stare y'all down till I get amen <laughs> but when we're married is that not our, our, our belief and our goal we're going to build a home the city it's going to be heaven on earth. <laughs> I forced that joke because my wife is watching. But what is the key here? And this is what I tell people getting married and people who are, are, are having some fusses in their marriage. The key is communication. Amen. They were speaking the same language, and they were speaking the same thing. They're in agreement. They have a goal, and they have a purpose. My friends... I just saved you about $600 in marriage counseling. 
right? You don't need Dr. Phil. You don't need Oprah. You need to talk. Amen. Now, men, I'm going to talk to you for a second. You need to listen. Ladies, you need to not scream. <laughs> I know, I'm meddling now. Honest, I know. <laughs> I'm pretty tough when my wife's watching on TV and not here. I'm bold. But isn't that the truth? The lost art of communication, especially between husband and wife. Men are the worst communicators. Hey, ladies, can I get an amen? Amen. Right? <laughs> John. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right, brother. But right? And so I, I encourage them, if they're about to get married, always, always have open communication, always have honest communication, agree, hey, I'm not going to get mad. You're going to agree not to get mad. We're going to talk this out. And God says, there ain't nothing you can't do. Same with if the, there's a problem in marriage. Anyway, let's keep going. Uh, that, that's a good, good biblical truth right there for whatever you're, you're, you're going through. Whatever your goal is as a church, say we want to uh, uh, expand a portion of the ministry. If everyone's in agreement and we're all praying about it and we're all together on this, there's nothing we can't do, right? It's a very cool principle. Anyway, let's keep going here. And so God says, come, let us go down. He's talking to the Trinity. And let's confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Here's where we get the different languages and, and speeches. God confuses their languages. Now, it is believed, I don't know how they figured this out. I think it's because in chapter 10, they listed 70 people. And so at this point, a lot of the rabbis, a lot of the, the, the teachers, not all of them, but a lot of them that I use to study, says that, that God probably created up to 70 languages. That's pretty interesting, right? I mean, just, that's wild. Only God could do that. So he does that, and it says in verse 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad over, from there over the face of the earth. Here's, a, here's the next little lesson here. God's will will be done. <laughs> and friends, if God has laid something on your heart and is challenging you to do something, man, don't fight him on it. He will just confuse you. <laughs> He will, he, will, he will aggravate you. I don't know if those are the right words, but man, he'll, he'll get you to do it, right? So just do his will to begin with and save yourself a lot of heartache. And it says they scatter them all over the face of the earth, so they cease building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abro abroad over all the face of all of the earth. Uh, I gave you, what scripture did I give you? Second, Peter 2, 5. Okay, would you read that one first? Now, wait a minute, let me set it up. They made bricks instead of stone, right? Is that not a picture of, of a cult and false religion? Yep. All their little disciples got to be the same, made in the same mold. Let, if, if, don't close your eyes, but if you close your eyes and I describe this, tell me who it is. Young men, black slacks, black shoes, white shirt, tie, riding a bicycle. Yeah. Men and black, yeah. Look for the aliens, because here they come. Right? I mean, orange wrap around serape thing. The Christmas, right? They're all, they all form you into a brick. And they use tar, this sticky, yucky substance, to try to keep everyone together. That's not our God. That's false religion. Now go ahead and read that. It said they use brick instead of stone. Go ahead and read that. God uses living stones. Men make brick. God made stones. And you know what's cool about stones? They're different sizes, different shapes, different colors. Look at God's beautiful creation of humans. People get so caught up. Well, if there's only from Adam and Eve, how come there's so many races and stuff like that? I'm so glad God did that. I mean, how, I mean look what God did with, with two ears, two eyes, and nose and a mouth. Look at that. I mean, it's awesome, right? Yeah. Our God is so cool. And different hair colors and stuff. God did that. And we're living stones. And the, the New Testament tells us that instead of asphalt, instead of mud, what, puts, what, what keeps the, the building of God together? Love. Isn't that awesome? That is so cool. And then, Debbie, while you're still there, would you drop down and read 2 Peter 1.3? I'm sorry, you, you, you switched pages before. This is 2 Peter 1.3. This is a great little scripture, too. 
these people, they were trying to build a city. They were trying to find peace on earth and get to heaven and find their completion, right? Check out what Peter tells us in this scripture. This divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. We have all of that through the Lord Jesus Christ. How cool is our God? Isn't that awesome? I, you know, it's a, I'm so glad I've been saved all these years, and I still get so excited from God. I'm, I'm happy that that happens to me <laughs> because God is so cool. Isn't that a great portion of Scripture? Amen. Now, let's, from verse 10 through verse 26, we have a list of more Shem's descendants and some of that stuff. I'll let you guys read all that on your own. We won't do that. But let's take up our reading at verse 27 because now we come to uh, kind of a divide in the Bible. God is no longer dealing with, with humankind as a whole, but now we're going to start focusing on God's covenant, God coming down with man to bring about his son. And this man, who's the father of the faith? Abraham. We're going to start looking at Abraham and getting into that study so that the, 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 the text will start making a little change now. We're only going to finish out chapter 11. We won't get into 12, so you'll get out a little early tonight. But let's, let's set this up for next time. It says, this is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram. Abram is the father of the faith. He will be Later, we will see his name will be changed to Abraham. This is the guy that God will make his covenant through. That's one of his sons. His other son is Nahor and uh, Haran. So we had the three boys. Now, the brother Haran, he begot Lot. So we're going to, Lot's going to play into, into this story. We'll learn a lot about Lot. So Lot would be Abram's nephew, right? Okay. Now, verse 28. Now, Haran, that's the dad. I mean, the, the son, he died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. So here, Lot's dad died, but grandpa's still alive. And Abram and Nahor, Abram and his dad, took wives, I mean his brother, took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. And the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of, and I can't say that guy's name. So we're setting up who, the, the, the couples here. Verse 30. But Sarai was barren. She had no children. Now this will play into effect as we continue our study in Genesis here. She's not able to have a baby. She's Abram's wife. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, because his son, Lot's daddy died, so grandpa is now raising Lot, right? The son of Haran and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, and his, his son Abram's wife, and they went with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Notice that, Terah, uh, Terah died in Haran. Now, I need you to turn with me to two places in the New Testament. The first one is the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. Now, all this is very important to understand what's going on, and it's the foundation that we need before we get into the next chapter here. Everyone at Hebrews 11? Let's look at verse 8. Verse 8 of 11 says this, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Okay, now turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 7. When you get there, just say amen. Okay, let's start reading at verse 1. This is Stephen's last sermon here. And the high priest said, are these things so? Notice verse 2. And he, this being Stephen, said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Where is that? That's Ur of the Chaldeans, right? Before he dwelt in Haran. 
and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to the land which I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to the land in which he now dwells. See what's happening here? God spoke to Abram, not to his dad, and said, leave your family. Leave your home. And you go to a place that I'm going to show you. So what did he do? The father of the faith. He packed up dad and nephew Lot and took off. The first campsite they went to was a place called Haran. Isn't that what it said? Guess what the name Haran means? You guys ready for this? Delay. And now the Bible tells us in Acts and in Genesis that it's not till his dad died that God spoke to him again. He stayed there until his dad died. Why? He wasn't, supposed to, he wasn't supposed to have his dad. He wasn't supposed to have Lot, and Lot's going to cause some problems. Now, in um, Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, tells us that Abram's family made idols, that his dad, his, his dad was an idol maker, and they worshipped idols. Can you see where that might be a problem if you're trying to establish your covenant with somebody? Might be a little, little problem, right? And so now here Abraham, the father of the faith, he doesn't start off too good, does he? So that gives us a little hope. <laughs> but he's stuck in delay because he would not obey. My little book back there, Fear Forward, is this story. Now it's an interesting story because I can relate to it. Because I'll be honest with you, when God told me what to do, I only 50% obeyed. And 50% Obedience is 100% disobedience. Now we're going to find that in delay, in Haran, he builds up a lot of wealth. He does okay there. But friends, let me tell you honestly, I only 50% obeyed God and, and I didn't leave the funeral home and all of stuff and I was making money and doing stuff like that. But friends, no amount of money, nothing, no, nothing Amen. takes the place of having God talk to you. Amen. And for over two years, God didn't talk to me. I'd read his Bible, and I was reading, but, and I was ministering. I was helping another church and doing the bulk of the, the pastor work there. And see, the angels even said that's the way, right? And, and, and the, the Bible says that living waters will flow out of you. I, I had to, like, pump it out. It was, it was horrible. Friends, there's nothing like God, the presence of God and God talking to you. But we put ourselves in delay because we don't obey, right? And that's what happened to Abram. But now his father dies. He's stuck with Lot, and that's going to cause him some challenges. But, you know, God is going to honor that. And we will get into the rest of that next week. How's that sound? So if you want to, you can read chapters 12 and 13, and we'll get into that next week. All right? Let's, let's close in prayer and then we'll talk. Father in heaven, thank you for the study of your word. And I pray, God, you'd help each and every one of us. Lord, we learned a lot of awesome things tonight. The first and most important is that we need you, that our only salvation comes from no one except you. And through your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, Father. And we thank you, God, for that. And Lord, we also learned here just now that the importance of trusting you and obedience, Father. Even when your instructions might be pretty hard to take, Lord, that would, that would be tough. But, Father, we can trust you in all things, and we're so grateful for that. So, Lord, be with us now as we break, and just help each of us as we review these things, Lord. Speak to our hearts and make that personal application. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Don't forget uh, our normal schedule for Sunday. It's going to be awesome. Bless you.